Good afternoon, everybody. This is Guillermo Sabatier, your host for today on Perspectives on Energy. And um, today we'll be talking about the uh, blackout in Pakistan. Uh, my background, of course, I am an electrical engineer, uh, and I worked in the power industry for, industry for 30 years. So I have a little bit of background on this. Uh, currently, I'm the Director of International Services for HSI, the Health and Safety Institute, specifically in uh, industrial skills training. So uh, let's dive right in. Earlier in the week, uh, Pakistan had a, uh, a blackout that uh, pretty much de-energized the majority of its national grid. Um, this is the second time this happened in the last few months. Um, so they definitely had some problems. Uh, this time, apparently, they had an issue with uh, voltage swings that eventually led to a free frequency collapse which on its own ends up spiraling into a, vo into a voltage collapse. And that's usually the causes of most blackouts, right? Either you're collapsing voltage. Frequency often isn't the, um, the only, the only uh, cause of a blackout. Usually they have under frequency load shedding schemes that will normally uh, shed the appropriate amount of load automatically. And usually that saves the day. But in this case, uh, if you have a voltage collapse, that tends to be kind of hard to be able to to uh, get around that in that case. So one of the things to consider right in this uh, event is the fact that this is the second time this happens in, uh, in less than a year in the country. So it is definitely a concern. Uh, they, uh, they were able to restore most of their system back in about three days. Um, had a lot of problems with infrastructure. And of course, you know, now, nowadays in a highly connected society, um, a lot of their um, puts a lot of hardship in a, in, a, in an economy that's already struggling, right? Uh, one of the things that 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 uh, became apparent was the fact that um, most everybody has backup generation, right? At either every industrial or commercial facility. But the problem was that in a lot of these cell phone towers, the um, provider was running out of fuel at these uh, gen sets for most of these towers. So after maybe six, seven, eight hours of of running on, on the backup generator, they're they're running out of fuel, whether it's diesel or gasoline. So that presents another problem. So so in this case, uh, we'll talk about some of the general blackout causes, uh, how system operations personnel usually um, can either predict, plan ahead, or even even in uh, as as a few minutes away, a few seconds away take uh, mitigating actions but in the end of the day if, if if the system is set up in a way that's very difficult to manage uh all their efforts may you know may especially if they, if they got set up with a bad plan for that day uh they, they could really have problems so uh, again there's still investigations going on we won't know the, the root cause if we ever do for what happened until maybe a few weeks from now um we've, we've had similar incidents in europe similar incidents in um in the us um, a few weeks ago, we we had Europe, you know, ro doing some uh, feeder rotation, and and they were getting ready for rotating blackouts. But fortunately, they got lucky. It was about weather. They did not encounter those challenges. Right now in Pakistan, however, um, yeah, one of the one of the root causes they've been discussing quite a bit is the um, they haven't kept up with their uh, infrastructure. Uh, basically, modernizing the grid, maintaining the grid. Uh, sometimes even um, reconducting equipment, uh, substation maintenance, generator maintenance. Uh, for the most part, you know, it's, it's it's just a matter of maintaining it. Right now, of course, the media and everybody else is blaming grid reliability on the fact that it, you know it hasn't been maintained. But again, we will discuss that further once we know more information as to what happened. Uh, for now, I can definitely say that um, from my experiences, right, and and I don't mean to speculate, but one of the things that that normally puts a utility um, in peril, meaning uh, reliability for that day, is 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 a long term planning horizon, mid term and short term planning horizon. Right. So what are those, right? So uh, and we'll break those down uh, as we discuss it over the next uh, half hour. So one of the, the a long term planning horizon basically in, uh, looks at what your load will look like over a span of uh, five, 10, 15 years. Are you seeing a lot of uh, customer growth? Are you seeing a lot of industrial growth in your area? Well, in that case, you know, you'd have to probably plan ahead and start uh, designing, siting, and permitting 
a lot of and budgeting for a lot of uh, expanded generation, right? And in a lot of cases, you know, as, as your fleet ages or you're replacing some of these uh, dirtier fossil fuel fleets with something that's cleaner burning, natural, natural gas, or even going with some of the renewables. And so that that all requires planning in, in like a five to six year lifespan. So this this um, this planning horizon of uh, five years to a decade, right, usually looks at uh, expected or forecasted uh, load growth. So they will plan ahead with that. If if load is growing in an area that weren't there before, then they may require, of course, a construction of new transmission lines and even distribution infrastructure. Right. So if that's planned right and planned well, uh, you will meet that that load with a new generation mix. You have the adequate amount of transmission. You have the right correct rights of way. And then ultimately, as load grows, you'll have enough of a buffer to be able to manage that um, those reliability needs, right, on top of the, your your basic um, generation and, and economic needs, right? So one of the things that happens is uh, oftentimes these these um, these planning cycles don't don't they're put off or postponed. They don't go as well. So then they they make do with what they have, and they they continue to absorb all this load with the existing infrastructure. And then every, uh, as you continue to add more load to that to that already existing uh, source, uh, you end up uh, making your margins much, much narrower. And as, as the years go by, eventually your, your margin is so narrow that you, you are getting dangerously close to being able to survive uh, a most severe single contingency. So I don't know what happened there yet, but it seems to me that there's a combination of factors on there, right? The long-term planning horizon uh, this is, is is where the aspect comes in of uh, maintaining infrastructure and properly developing infrastructure. So that's 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 a long term. Near term, of course, is you're looking over the next few next few years, right? A lot of that has to do with uh, ampacity upgrades on lines, uh, adding reactive devices to support voltage, um, upgrading, for example, the carrying capability of some of these transformers and some of these substations, right? So a lot and a lot of times, most of or most of these components, and not all of them, especially in a system that's already heavily loaded, that usually gives you an extra three to five years, right, to be able to get by. And it's not as not as expensive as as building new generation and new transmission lines. So, so it's almost as if you're stretching the life of what you've got. In a lot of cases, right, adding uh, transmission capacitor banks, right, will help support voltage. But then, of course, you know the the benefit of that is now you have increased the carrying capacity. The transfer capability, right, of that particular uh, path to carry more, more, more flow, which means now you can have generation from somewhere else come and supply load at the other end uh, without sacrificing voltage as in, in as much, right? So in this case, right, they'll they'll plan these particular um, upgrades, whether it's compa- uh, opacity upgrade, usually on, on, tra- on transmission lines. Or they'll even uh, adding all of these like reactive devices to support voltage, right? That definitely helps with uh, the the dangers of a voltage collapse. Which, as I said earlier, a voltage collapse can pretty much um, lead you down in, into an area of instability, and then pretty quickly into a blackout. Right? Uh, frequency collapse. Usually, there's uh, protection systems in place that will shed load um, automatically, depending on you know how how badly that rate of decay is for frequency right I and mean, usually that saves a day i've seen several utilities have that happen where they were able to uh by design uh preset it actually saved the day so they were able to survive their their transmission grid you know was still energized i mean they shed a, a lot of their distribution customers but their transmission grid was still intact and they were able to restore from that starting point so uh now let's look at a near term and here in the U.S. and Canada, and NERC has specific regulatory standards, and they regulate, for example, uh, real-time operations, right, of uh, of, of the grid. Uh, whether you're a transmission provider, or a system operator, a uh, balancing authority, reliability coordinator, and one of the things that that is particularly important is what they call the next day planning. That's usually governed by uh, NERC standards TOP002. For the transmission operators and then with the reliability coordinators they have an IRO 008 and IRO 006. So these are two different standards right it, it have an impact on both sides right so they each have responsibilities for reporting and also disseminating information. So what are those standards right so those standards uh, 
they they pose the, impose the obligation of actually having to study all of your outages and, and system conditions for the next day or the next several days, right? So normally in um, most utilities, right, uh, usually maintenance has to happen. They have to take out a transmission line. They need to take out a transformer. They need to take out a, a component out in the system. And it's usually a, of course, the one that, that's that's the most important is the transmission systems, right? Anything above 100 kV. So, and for the most part, right, uh, that you, you know, we, we used to not study the next day, right? So now, for example, you have programs like uh, Siemens' PSSE or Power Factory from uh, DIG Silent, for example, that allow, allow you to take a model of your system, meaning all the lines, all the buses, all the stations, all the generators, all the loads, right, all the reactive devices, and, and uh, you you have a pretty good mathematical mathematical model of your system, which you, which you can then study and simulate. So what you'll do is you you know you'll look at your expected load for that that day or that week, for example, you look at your um, uh, planned equipment outages, whether it's a line, a bus, or a transformer, or reactive devices, and you'll you'll basically get your model and you'll take and you'll set up your system uh, exactly as it would be when you know uh, for the time time period you're studying for say you're studying it for 1400 hours you know on on a wednesday well you know, you'll set the the load curve for that day the expected load you'll set up the generation profile you'll set up well, what generations are in service which ones are out of service you'll even set up for example the loading of the generators based on their economic dispatch right uh, you'll also set up the uh, expected um Power transactions, uh, meaning uh, the flow, the flow of power between utilities, right? Who's buying and selling power? And who's, for example, wheeling power from one area to the next? You'll also be uh, setting up, for example, but most importantly, you're looking at the um, at the element outages. Well, if there's a certain line that's going to be out of service for that day, and it's planned. Well, part of your part of your plan is to actually study that and see if your system can support it, right? So ideally, once you run the study, right, then you'll you'll do a what if analysis to see what happens if the next component, you know, goes out of service and right, accidentally. So in this case, you're already preparing yourself to see if you can withstand the most severe single contingency. So you do like a base case study where you see what your system will look like and make sure you don't have any real time base case overloads. And then you'll do what they call a contingency analysis, which is looking at uh, uh, a what if scenario. So what, how the way this works is that based on your model, the system state estimator will go ahead and take a uh, one component out at a time, run a power flow study, and then we'll show you what the result is of that one component being out of service. Then it puts it back, runs it again, and it does it for every single component in your system, every single element in your system until it, it's done, right? So the worst offenders, for example, um, will show up first on the list of contingencies, and it says for the loss of this line, you'll have this other element overloading or under voltage or over voltage. And then you can make decisions based on that, whether you can proceed with that outage or not, or you have a mitigation, right, to go and proceed forward. Um, there have been outages in the U.S. Uh, that 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 resulted in, 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 in a, so some blackouts, right, that, that involves several areas. Um, and as a result of that, NERC eventually came up with these standards to make sure you have an adequate next day study, meaning that, and that's what it is, right? It's next day planning, right? So make sure you haven't, you've studied your next day, you've studied your near term. And uh, one of the suspicions we're having is the fact that it, them, them may not have done adequately in Pakistan, we don't know yet. But usually, for example, if you have, um, you're saying that there was some switching happening and that switching caused the voltage instability, which then, of course, you know, uh, caused the voltage swing, and then eventually that voltage swing caused the frequency swing, and then you know, it, from that from that point, the whole thing you know collapsed and cascaded. So, uh, if you're unable to handle that sort of uh, condition, right, where you're switching, and and they may have done a proper study of that particular line outage, right? The issue there is that something may not have been modeled correctly when they were trying to either switch it back in service, or, but. What's what's more concerning is that something when it got switched out of service caused that issue, which means that particular uh, outage wasn't properly studied, or worse, it wasn't properly modeled in the system. So somebody may have studied, they may have looked great on paper, but when they went ahead and uh, tried and executed in real life, uh, the results were not matching what they had seen on their forecast, which is a concern. So again, this will be something that they were 
probably look into it in much, much greater detail. Um, so how does one now, the, now the, these are the, the these are the reasons, for example, that you may run into a a blackout situation from the planning perspective, right? So what happens if everything's planned right? You're operating, everything's looking looking like uh, everything in real time is looking pretty close to what you saw on your day ahead study, right? On your day ahead plan. So if you're if you're the operator and you're, you're the grid operator, you're the dispatcher sitting at the desk and you're 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 basically flying this plane, right? That that is this performing how you predicted or what the engineers predicted was going to happen. All of a sudden, you lose one or two more components beyond that uh, most severe single contingency. So now you're in a double contingency or for what they what they call N minus two, right? So N minus one is a usual what if for every one contingency that you lose at a time. N minus two is for, the, for two contingencies ahead. And usually they don't plan that far unless it's a defined double contingency. But if you're in a situation right now, it's up to you to go ahead and do do studies on your own in real time while you're there, right? And that may involve, you know, canceling outages. That may involve doing just taking certain actions, and in some cases, up to and including the shedding of firm load. Um, may not have a lot of time to do all this, but that's usually what the real time operator is going to be faced with in this time, right? Usually shedding load, usually separating, usually uh, going up in an island condition, which means. You may have an area of load that has its own generation that's separated, uh, has, has no ties with the neighboring areas, but it's still, you know, running, not synchronized, but that's an island, right? So, so that's another situation they may find themselves in. So, um, one of the things that we do at HSI and uh, industrial train, industrial skills training, is uh, train these system operators on how to go through these steps, right? Where it's like uh, there's the planning aspect of it, understanding how that works. And then there's the actual uh, operator uh, real-time uh, operations of the system. And one of the ways to prepare them for that is to do simulation training. And we have a simulator, which I'll show at a later date, right, and, uh, uh, to do a full demo, that gives them an overview of how to run a, a power system, right? And uh, one of the things that, that you understand, right, is, is uh, what, what the effects are, for example, of having unplanned outages happen beyond the scope of what you're already, beyond the work that you had already planned, right? And how to react to that. In a lot of cases, usually it involves quick mitigation or running a study, but when you don't have enough time, uh, especially studies reveal, um, usually you may have maybe minutes, or sometimes you may have hours to take action. And a lot of times that may lead to, at worst, the shedding of firm customer load, which means opening up, uh, you're gonna put some customers in the dark to save the rest of your system. But in most cases, what happens is they have to usually redispatch generation or they have to cancel planned outages that either are already in effect or that uh, are that they're waiting to, to to actually be executed, right? So in a lot of cases, if if a field crew has a line that they're going to take out of service and you're noticing problems already, and the taking of that line based on your studies reveals that you know it's gonna it's going to get really, really bad well, then it's up to you to go ahead and cancel that outage or postpone it, right? And for the reasons being that you ran a study and, and this line is not working based on some other conditions that, that were not foreseen in the day I had planned, right? Which which happens all the time, right? You can have a, a generator that, that, that came out of service um, at a trip, or you may have some issue with a, with a solar site. Uh, they lost a line that feeds, feeds out of the solar site. And that can change your entire plan. And once your whole plan has changed, then now it's you have to do it on a on a on a on a case by case basis. Whether that particular outage can can be carried out. So these are just examples, right, of um, how you can get to a blackout. Um, again, training is a, is a really important aspect for the system operators, right, when it comes to uh, running the grid. But it's not just the actual real time operator because if they're stuck with a really bad plan for that day, where they're coming up with a lot of surprises that they weren't expecting. Then that's also a bad plan, right? So, so there's training that goes on the back end to make sure the next day plan is done correctly, right? As well, and then even the long, the 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 near term studies, right? So some of these outages are studied two or three weeks in advance to give them like a rough idea whether this can be done this time of the this time of the year or seasonal, right? So in a lot of cases, right? Like right now, um, I'm not sure what the seasonal what the seasonal conditions are in Pakistan right now, but I imagine they could be going through a winter. So in a lot of cases, right, uh, there's a lot of winter load. Usually it's a lot of inductive or heating strips, which, which places a lot of demand in the system. 
uh, at certain times of the day, right? More so than, than, than the summer where you have a lot of air conditioning mode. So that is an example, right? Uh, seasonal things that could be done. And, and, and in a lot of places, the, usually uh, generator outages and transmission outages happen in a, what's known as the shoulder months, which is usually at times of mild weather, whether it's spring or it's in the fall. Now, every once in a while, you run into a, a mild, mild winter, and then some planners are, you know, they they want to take advantage of this opportunity, and they go ahead and schedule an outage. And then all of a sudden, this mild season, this mild break in the weather only lasted one or two weeks, but the outage is a three, four week long outage. So now, now they find themselves with a lot of high demand on load without enough resources to meet it. So that's another challenge, right? When when you see when it comes to different causes of a blackout. Um, another example as well is, is, is usually, um, the ones I've seen usually, usually stems from, from either a, a bad plan. Uh, I've, seen, I've seen some outages happen from the fact that they, they, they had too many outages at the same time. In some cases, you have something that was completely unplanned that somebody was troubleshooting at a station and they went ahead and uh, disabled uh, some of the protection to be able to troubleshoot something. And then the fault happens. And then uh, you had uh, you had a sustained fault that that, that was there for, for like a long period of time. And then you ended up with uh, the fault clearing from all of the remote ends at the station, which, of course, you know, that uh, this utility lost about 25, 30 different generators all throughout, throughout the system. So really, really significant. Of course, that led to an under frequency event. But fortunately, the under frequency load shedding uh, took took effect, and uh, they were able to actually not black out. They saved the system. To the customers, it felt like a blackout because they were sitting in the dark. But the transmission grid was mostly intact, and they were able to restore everything back in about three to four hours. So it was really, really significant in that case. So um, I uh, again, I'm really anxious to see what I'm eager to see what happened. I, I feel really, really bad for 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 that particular. Uh, the customer, their customers. I feel bad for the utility. I feel bad for 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 for, for Pakistan in general for w- what they went through. Right, right now, they they. I know that they're having their challenges when it comes to the economy at this time, and and uh, but they did a great job in restoring. Uh, I know for a fact that there some of the nuclear plants, some of their coal plants are still going to be out uh, another two or three days at least, because that's normally how long it takes to get those units back online. So uh, hopefully they'll be able to do this uh, rather soon and get back to normal. But again, I mean, it's it's um, this is a problem that is not unique to Pakistan. I think the majority of the world right now is experiencing challenges when it comes to maintaining infrastructure. Uh, build, building additional lines is not an easy thing, uh, especially since everybody has what they call not in my backyard. Uh, Navy, I think, it, which is not in my backyard attitude. Right? Which is like nobody wants to see a brand new power, a brand new transmission line through their area. But everybody knows they need it, right? So that's one example. The other one is nobody wants to allow the building of new conventional generation. Everybody wants uh, renewables, which is great, but that also causes an issue with reliability sometimes. So uh, a, a lot of different things are happening. Um, we saw some of the challenges in Europe right now with with their issues when it comes to uh, fuel. Um, so again, this will be an interesting year uh, as we're approaching. We're right now in the in the peak of winter in the in some places, right? But where I'm at, it's just mild weather. But I, for us, the summers are, are 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 brutal when it comes to load and heat. So, so again, I'm really really interested to see what they find as a root cause and what the what were the different components that lined up to place them in this uh, blackout condition and, and and what it was that impacted their reliability so so severely that they blacked out. All right. Well, again, thank you so much for uh, joining me today, and uh, hopefully, I'll have a uh, second segment of this particular discussion. Uh, coming up in a few weeks. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook. Instagram, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.